Good morning, and welcome to worship. I'm Andy Dunning. I'm the pastor here at University Park United Methodist Church. This video is being shown this morning both on YouTube and on Facebook, and from 10 to 11 o'clock, we're responding live to comments on both those platforms. The video will remain up on our YouTube channel for you to watch later if you'd like. If you're with us today for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. For more than 125 years, University Park United Methodist Church has worked to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ for our neighborhood and for the world beyond. If you are new to worship here at U Park, please feel free to say hi and ask questions about the church in our comments. I'll be happy to get back to you. If you'd like to receive our newsletter and our weekly pastoral letter, be sure to fill out the welcome form that you'll find below this video on YouTube and linked on our Facebook site as well. We'll make sure to let the, get those communications out to you. Also, please do click on those subscribe and like buttons on YouTube. The more people who subscribe to our channel and like our videos, the easier we are to find online. So we really appreciate the help. Whoever you are, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, you are welcome here. When the pandemic is under better control and we're able to be back home here in our church sanctuary for worship, we would love to have you join us. I want to thank Joel McDaniel for being our liturgist today. So let's center ourselves, take a deep breath. Let's open our hearts to God's presence as Joel offers us our call to worship. God of every good gift, we join in worship today seeking many things. Some of us are seeking peace. Some are seeking healing. Some are seeking answers. The others are looking for the right questions. We trust that you will give us what we need knowing that your presence is what we need most and what we already have. Amen.
Bethany Hader Krabs, and I'm the Director of Wholeness and Healing. If you're a guest worshiping with us today, we'd like to invite you to fill out our guest information form. You can find the link to that form in the description of the YouTube video. It just helps us to get to know you better and also helps us to connect you with our other ministries. During this part of the service, we ask a question and invite you to respond in our live stream chat. Today's sermon is about being fully alive, so I would like to ask you to name something that brings you vitality. This week, Eleanor and I stopped one day for maybe five minutes and let her swing on the swings outside. Um, it's been pretty cold and snowy this week, so didn't get much chance for outside play, but I know that she was pretty excited about that. And for me, one of the things that I try to do is to get enough water each day. So I'd like to invite you to share something that brings you vitality in the live stream chat now. First Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. We will proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called bo both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. I 
rest and guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me Good morning, family. My name is Rodera Paris Woods, and I am the director of Journeys of Faith, Children, Youth, and Family Ministries here at University Park United Methodist Church. Here at U Park, we have named our children change agents as we believe in creating and cultivating the leaders of today for a better tomorrow. Calling all change agents, report to headquarters for your next mission. Good morning, change agents. How are you all doing this morning? Awesome. So I pray that you all are staying well and safe. So today, I would like to talk to you about what it is to be fully alive. So one Friday, my sister called me and I wasn't too happy. I was kind of sad. And she was talking to me and she eventually said, wait a minute, you have to preach on Sunday. And I said, yes, I do. And she was like, well, what is your sermon about? And I said, well, how about I just read it to you? So I read her my sermon and when I was finished, I stopped. And she said, wow, and got silent. And I was like, okay. I didn't know what the wow meant, right? And she said, when I first called you, you sound really sad and really down. But when you read your sermon and we were talking about it, she said, I could hear you smile through the phone. She said, what you do in ministry really make you come alive. And I thought about that. And I was like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize, I really didn't realize that. And I was just like, hmm, I guess so. It's something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I love. And I want to tell you today that God wants us to be fully alive in God. What are your passions today? What things do you love to do? What things do you do and it make you smile without even smiling? What are those things that make you feel fully alive, that gives you so much joy? That when you're feeling sad and you're feeling down, when you begin to talk about those things or think about those things, that a smile just comes on your face. That someone can hear you smile through the phone. What are those things? I want you to think about those things today. And I want you to do those things because God wants us to be fully alive in God. It's a joy to be fully alive and to do what brings us joy and what brings us happiness and what puts a smile on our faces through the phone. So today, change agents, your job is to be fully alive and also to pass that spirit on to everyone you meet. Amen and Ashe. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time that you allowed us to gather together. We thank you for your spirit, and we thank you for the things that are our passions, the things that help us to be fully alive. Strengthen us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Ashe. 
Until next time. For the past three Sundays, we've been focusing on our church's vision for ministry with a sermon series called Dreams and Visions. Now, like I said last week, for 16 weeks between August and November of last year, a diverse group of people from this church of different ages, different faith history, different forms of church engagement and participation, all gathered to discern who we felt God is calling our congregation to be in this chapter of our life together. Through a process of prayer and research and interviews and data gathering, we emerged with four results. First, we developed a deeper understanding of the values that have shaped this church over the decades and a renewed commitment to those values. Second, we wrote a reconciling statement that declares our intent to be as open and diverse a community as we possibly can. And then third and fourth, we wrote clear statements of mission and vision that are intended to help us navigate our course over the next decade or so of ministry. We envisioned our church as an intergenerational, diverse, radically inclusive Christian community where families and individuals grow spiritually through fellowship, spiritual practice, and service. That's who the vision team felt that we are called to be. Our mission is what we do to fully become that church that we envision. So we imagined as our mission embodying our Christian faith with grace, mercy, and humility through spiritual practice, Christ-like service, cultivating wholeness, seeking justice, and caring for God's creation. Now in the first week of this sermon series, I wanted to talk about the importance of Christian community. That was also the weekend, as it turned out, after the insurrection at the Capitol building in D.C. So I ended up talking about community much more broadly, about how our, we are needed and we are called to build communities in which everyone can be heard and honored. And I talked about the way that that might allow us to be part of the solution to the hatred and the division that has engulfed our country. 
Now, the second week of the sermon series was the weekend of the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. So, Radira Paris Woods, our director of children, youth, and family ministry, she and I offered a dialogue sermon drawing on King's final book, which is entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Radira and I talked about the challenges of creating a truly diverse community and how that community begins with the willingness to have our own beliefs and our own practices challenged, to genuinely credit the experiences of others, and to live with the discomfort that arises until we can reach a new understanding that includes all of us. Last Sunday, the third Sunday of the series, I talked about the role of spiritual practice in all its forms as we seek to build the community, to become the community that we envision. Our vision and our mission name things like fellowship and spiritual practice, service, cultivating wholeness, seeking justice, caring for God's creation. But you know, in the traditional Methodist understanding, all of these things are forms of spiritual practice because all of them allow God to work in us and through us and in the process to transform us so that God's light can be seen through the lives that we live. Like I said last week, when we commit ourselves to that lifelong process of being shaped and formed by God, we never know where it's going to lead. We just show up. We keep showing up and we see what happens. So, over the past three weeks, we've talked about our vision and our mission as who we are called to be and what we are called to do. But there's another way of thinking about those things that seems important to me, and I wanted to talk about it today. When we embrace a vision for ministry and when we settle on a mission for our church, we are in some sense saying that in this church, these things describe how we practice our faith. They describe how we practice the faith. Now, we're not saying that we're right and everybody else is wrong about that. There are lots and lots of ways to be Christian. And even within our vision itself, we emphasize diversity because despite crusades and inquisitions and heresy trials and other historical abominations, diversity has been a Christian value since Jesus. Remember, this is the guy welcoming all the people who no one else will, spending his time with outcasts, recruiting people who disagree with, and in some cases even hate each other, and then bringing them all together in one body. So other churches have different visions than we do, and that's fine. But this is ours. This is ours. An intergenerational, diverse, radically inclusive Christian community where families and individuals grow spiritually through fellowship, spiritual practice, and service. In that vision, we're offering one picture of a community that can help people flourish and that can help our neighborhood and our world flourish as well. Now, a few minutes ago, we heard Joel read from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Like I've said before in sermons when I've preached about this book of the Bible, the Corinthian church at the time that Paul wrote this letter, it was a deeply divided, angry group of people. They were fighting about leadership. They were fighting about how to worship. They were fighting about Christian standards of behavior. They were so caught up in their anger and their outrage that they had stopped caring about fairness or compassion or decency or anything except winning the fight. Paul calls them puffed up with their own arrogance, their self-righteous conviction that they're right and everybody else is wrong. I'll spare you the obvious comparison, but you see it, right? The biblical scholar N.T. Wright has written a terrific book called Paul, A Biography. Now, it's not a biography in the traditional sense that we think of it today. It's more like Wright's very wise and thoughtful take on the story of Paul's work starting new churches, where he traveled, when, why, of how his thoughts about God and about the church developed over time, about the controversies over who could be included in this new church and what was required of them to join. Wright says something in that book that has stuck with me in the months since I read it. 
He says that in starting these new churches, Paul is not just founding a new religion. He's offering a new way of being human, a new way of understanding ourselves beyond tribe and history, beyond ethnicity or social standing, beyond all the things that leave us at the mercy of a social system that we did not create and do not control. In Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, I think the real problem that he's pointing out over and over in all kinds of different ways is that the people in that church understand themselves in exactly the way their society has trained them to do. They understand themselves in a rigidly stratified hierarchy of power and honor and wealth. Clearly, the wealthy and the powerful people in the Corinthian church still understand themselves in that old way. They believe that they are entitled to greater deference, greater respect, greater consideration and honor than others. Meanwhile, There are these three factions in the church, all of them vying for power. Each faction believes that they're right, that everybody else is wrong, that they should be the ones to control the church and call the shots. Some people there in the church at Corinth, when Paul wrote this letter, some of them believed that Christian freedom meant they could do anything they wanted with no constraint. They call it Christian freedom, but it's really just the freedom enjoyed by Roman nobility. Paul has invited the church, has invited the people of Corinth to be the people of God. Instead, they've simply chosen to be the citizens of Rome. Now, Paul addresses all these problems in what, at least at first, seems like a surprising way. He tells them that the wisdom of Rome, the empire's way of life, only appears to be powerful. It only appears to be wise. It only appears to work, and only then if you don't look very deeply. In the end, the people that Paul calls the wise one, the scribe, the debater of this age, have really nothing to offer that will genuinely transform lives. Real power, world-changing power, says Paul, is to be found in the example of Christ, the Messiah who knelt and washed his followers' feet, the one who went to the cross to save his friends. That power, Paul says, that power changes the world. That power makes all things new. Paul knows that this is an incredibly hard idea to embrace because in the end, Jesus doesn't look powerful at all. He looks like the leader of a failed uprising, publicly executed in the most humiliating and shameful way possible. Stripped, beaten, paraded through town, and then nailed to a cross so everybody passing can watch him die in agonizing slow motion. Nowadays, we would call this state-sponsored terror, and then it served the same function. Paul writes, We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. Paul's saying that the idea of a crucified Messiah makes no sense to anyone, or at least not to anyone who is still invested in the old way of life, where power and honor are to be constantly jealously guarded against a world always bent on taking them. Paul says to be Christian, to follow that crucified Messiah, is to see the world differently. It's to recognize that in following the crucified Christ, we give up that constant battle for power and status as the world understands it. We release our hold on the tools, the weapons of that battle. Instead, we embrace humility and mercy and grace, what Paul calls the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ crucified the power to remake the world. I got to say, it's kind of funny. I consider myself Christian, and the letter of 1 Corinthians has been around for almost 2,000 years, but when I hear myself say that stuff I just said, it still sounds impossibly naive. And it certainly would have sounded that way to Paul's first century audience. Wright puts it like this in that book I referred to. He says, Every time Paul came into a new town or city and opened his mouth, he knew perfectly well 
that what he was saying would make no sense to anybody. A crucified Messiah was a contradiction in terms. Around the year 185, a Christian bishop named Irenaeus in what's now France wrote a book arguing for what he believed to be an authentic way to practice Christianity in the midst of a culture that saw things differently. And in that book, Irenaeus wrote this, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. For Irenaeus, the human being most fully alive is Christ, who has reached the pinnacle of what it means to be human. So what does it mean to be fully alive? What does a fulfilled human life look like? It doesn't look like power or honor. It doesn't look like being greater than others, like displaying our own superiority, asserting or displaying our own righteousness. A fulfilled human life looks like the servant God. It looks like the crucified Christ. And it can be found, discovered, in a community that does not adhere to the prevailing standards of power or status, but rather finds the power and finds the wisdom of God in humility and compassion. This past Tuesday, I was in my office, I was working at my desk, when my phone rang. I picked it up, and on the other end of the line was a friend of mine from high school who I hadn't talked to in 35 years, probably more. Now, 35 years is a lot of time to catch up on, And we spent a couple of hours that afternoon sharing news of family and friends, talking about what we'd been up to for the past few, you know, decades. My friend has had quite a career, it turns out. He's worked in banking and the oil industry and IT. And one thing he said about his career really struck me. He said that as varied as his work had been, one characteristic all his jobs had in common was that he spent his entire career just one or two bad decisions away from being fired. That's the world he lived in. Tons of hours, lots of responsibility, high pressure, high demand. Over the years, kind and supportive people have said to me that being a pastor seems like a hard job. And I don't know, maybe it is, but I think almost every job is hard. The world my friend lived in That high pressure, high demand, high responsibility world where you're always one or two decisions away from being fired, in some way or another, we all live there, at least to some degree. Our jobs may not be on the line every day, every minute, but we're all under pressure to perform in all kinds of areas of our lives. Working in IT is hard. Always needing to expand your skills, work faster, do more with less. Commercial real estate That's really hard right now. I don't think I'd want to be doing that. Working for online retailers, that's hard. Public education, that's just ridiculously difficult right now. Doctors and other medical professionals are under extreme pressure for reasons obvious and perhaps not so obvious until we dig a little bit. I have long since, over the years of my ministry, I have long since lost count of the number of people in all kinds of careers who've told me that if they had it to do over again, they would never enter their field. Now we can sit around and compare suffering all day, but in the end, comparison like that, it's probably not the point. The point is not to ask who has it worst, but maybe the point is that we have created a society that is completely dependent on our anxiety to drive it forward. We have created a society in which we must buy our belonging, and if we can't, we get pushed to the margins. We have created a society that demands more and more from us under constant threat of failure or alienation or poverty or all three. To use Paul's phrase, that is the wisdom of this world at work. The one who is wise, the scribe, the debater of this age, maybe that's the best they have to offer. Top it off with a pandemic, and it is no wonder nerves are frayed. 
It is no wonder people are angry and divided and looking for somebody to blame. I think one way to understand Paul's vision of a church built around the image of a crucified Christ, one way perhaps to understand our vision of a church that cultivates wholeness and humility and service, is that we're looking for a different way to live, a different way to be more fully human, to be more fully alive. We are offering a community, we're trying to offer a community, that doesn't ask what people produce or how fast they work, a community built on grace and mercy and wholeness, a place where people can belong just by walking in the door. And as we learn to offer that community here, creating that refuge, that sanctuary for others, perhaps we also learn to take the sanctuary and grace and peace we experience in our church community and offer it to others in the rest of our week. If we can do that, it seems to me that then our church will be a place for families and individuals to grow spiritually. Our church will be that community that we envision, to which we feel God is calling us. God will cultivate wholeness in us and in others. And the glory of a human being fully alive, which is to say the glory of God, will shine through us. Through us, God will bless the world in the name, in the example of the crucified servant Messiah. Let's pray together. God of every land and nation, God who seeks loving relationship with those of us at every possible social strata, every place in society, you've created all people and you dwell among us in Christ Jesus. We ask that you would listen to the cries of all who pray for you and all those who do not yet know how to pray to you. All those who are separated from one another, who are isolated and divided and angry. Grant that as we proclaim the greatness of your name, your love, your compassion, your servanthood, that we may know the power of that love at work in our lives and through us at work in our world. We pray all these things through Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. I am Kevin Fomberg Rollins, your church administrator, and it's time for Love and Faith in Action. For a number of years, University Park has embodied the values of the Reconciling Ministries Network. On February 14th this year, we will have the opportunity to officially join it. To become a reconciling congregation, the RMN requires that our church vote to approve a statement supporting the work of the RMN with a majority of 75% of those present. Today and next Sunday, February 7th, we will host Zoom gatherings from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. for anyone who is interested in learning more about this. We will have our official vote on Sunday, February 14th at 11.30 a.m. If you would like to join these gatherings, or if you have any questions about this process or the vote, please contact Pastor Andy. Grief Share is returning. Grief Share consists of seminars and support groups led by people who understand what you are going through and want to help. You'll gain access to valuable Grief Share resources to help you recover from your loss and look forward to rebuilding your life. Our next cycle of Grief Share will begin on Thursday, February 11th, and lasts for 13 weeks. Sessions will be held on Zoom on Thursday nights from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Please reach out to Bethany if you have any questions. That's all I have for you. I hope you all have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. May your life be always grounded in the love and the courage, the grace and the servanthood of Christ. May your imagination be always open to new possibilities of grace and wholeness. And may the peace of Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours now 
and forever. I am so glad that you joined us for worship today.